All right. Okay. Yeah. Kidding. Guys are live. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. All right, everybody. We're going to get started. Um, my name is Matt Priest. I'm president and CEO of the Four Distributors and Retailers of America, and I am excited that you guys are here. Very grateful for you to come. We're also live streaming this on on YouTube, so there are people watching. Uh, all around the world, and maybe even on 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, as we've come to learn. I'm joined here with Peter Bragdon. Peter Bragdon is a, a friend of mine. He's a board. Of, he's a member of our board of directors, FDRA. He's executive vice president, chief administrative officer, and general counsel at Columbia Sportswear. Peter, thank you for coming and having this frank and open conversation about uh, tariffs and trade. We appreciate it. It's good to be. Help me in welcoming Peter. So. So yesterday, uh, the administration put out two lists, two magical lists, 4A and 4B, the really sexy titles. And 4A is 53% of footwear trade volume. Um, that's going to have 10% duty on top of what we already pay on September 1st. And form 4B or list 4B um, comes out, it's 47% of trade. It comes out December 15th at 10%. This is on top of additional duties. The average import duty on 4A is 12.1%, the average import duty on 4B is 87. And so where does Columbia Sportswear fall when you look at these two lists between 4A and 4B? Well, first of all, what I said to the press yesterday when we got calls on it was, you know, I don't quite get it because the message seems to be that the Grinch stole half of Christmas and is coming back to get the other half That's right. Right, <laughs> right beforehand. That's generally our view of it. Yeah. It's too late and it's not enough. If you look at the list, uh, most of most of our product uh, that's coming from China will will be hit with those tariffs. There's a very small amount that's in the in the second uh, right second part. Right, uh, but that's assuming that the policy today is the policy that was in place yesterday. Mm -hmm. And I usually check my phone before these things start. And I would ask somebody to raise your hand if trade policy changes. Yeah, give us a heads up. This will alter what we say on the exactly. fly. Exactly. Yeah. So it's interesting because. Uh, when those lists came out, the press said, hey, are you breathing a sigh of relief? And I was like, are you kidding me? We're still going to pay $1.5 billion in additional duties on just on this one up front September 1st. Uh, and as we've talked about ad nauseum, it's really hard to move supply chains, even with six months notice, which is essentially what we don't even have that yet. Uh, what are you, how are you guys navigating all this? So, I mean, one thing we've been meeting on a regular basis, cross-functional teams from the CEO on down through the organization, anticipating uh, what can happen, which can be anything, mm -hmm. and looking for all, walking through all the ways you can try to mitigate the risk, both to our business, but the risk to consumers. That's where we're, we start with, you know, how, how are we going to deal with getting the product to consumers that they want? And so it's the full gamut, you know, what product can we move somewhere else and when? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can't. Uh, you know, one, and then it's sort of at the end of your list, you're thinking price increases. And we've announced that without specifics, we've announced that we would increase prices if these tariffs were put in place. Right. And then there's all inner uh, things in between. One being we simply won't offer the product in some cases in the U.S. And I could, there's a very s small number of products, one product type that we just won't offer. And we made because it, we cannot do so profitably. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one. And then I think in the longer term, uh, it won't just be us. People will be looking at it. Do we change the product in some way? Right. Do you take, I don't think I probably had six pockets on this shirt. Do I take a pocket off? Right. Or something like that. And if you think back to when candy companies had the price of chocolate going up, you paid the same for a bag of candy, but maybe there were fewer pieces in it. Yeah. So I think that's something that can happen as well. But it's uh, one thing we've tried to emphasize for, for the public is just the threat and the constant threat and changing threats about trade have a cost to them. And it's not just the, the time that we're spending on it, right. but it's also decisions get made in, in anticipation yeah. of something happening. Well, I'm glad you said that because I'm asked all the time, like, well, hey, you can flee to Vietnam and save 10%. And that's not how it works. You've got, you've got price spikes in Vietnam, demand is clearly going up. So even if, you, even if there are no duties put in place on September 1st, which we expect there fully will be, um, the consumer is going to pay more because all the rigmarole is going into the, the uncertainty and the movement of, of where you're going to be placing this product. And then the, what seems like artificial 
demand spike in places like Vietnam? Are you seeing that as you try to figure out what you're going to do next? Yeah, I mean, a, a couple of things. One, we're, Vietnam is already our, the largest base of uh, sourcing for us. And yeah. We have a highly diversified source base. So there's definitely a rush of people coming into places that we've already been. Mm -hmm. And that, that leads to you know, tighter capacity and, and different risks of, of, of you know, getting getting product place. I mean, right. we're, we, we're thankful to be in a good position. So I mean, that's sort of where we where we start. But I, I you know, talk to a lot of people who are in smaller, less diversified businesses who don't have the staff, yeah. you know, working on this full time. It's much harder. There were some of them who really trapped. The other thing I would just say on the on the on the price increases, and this is not the case for us, but if you're sitting here in the middle of August and you until yesterday you think there's going to be a price increase or an increase on September 1st, uh, there's a good chance that companies have already moved that in motion. And this is not right. like somebody's stocking the shelves and just putting a new price tag on it. Yeah. Uh, and it's a total misunderstanding in Washington about how supply chains work. I mean, yeah, tell me about it. Tell me about it. So I'm going to ask you a really hard hitting question. I think I know the answer to it, but. Does China pay the tariffs? The answer would be no. Okay, that's what I thought. I just want to set that straight. We've been debating it amongst, amongst um, not ourselves, because we know what the answer is, but among with the administration. And it seems to be one of the challenges. Right. The president has finally, I, I will say, the president with this policy, I think, inferred to the world that he believes that consumers pay the tariffs here in the U.S., <laughs> And then he went as far as to say yesterday, I think on the South Lawn or wherever he was in New Jersey, says we we delay this because Christmas, if prices go out, we're concerned. So he's got to be, they're under pressure. You know, you can't you can't rely on one economist on the planet, Peter Navarro, to guide you and think it's going to be the right thing when everyone else is saying that we pay the tariffs. So how do you think about that whole debate on who pays the tariffs? You know, you know imagine JFK, if he you know, stood on the steps of the Capitol and said, we're going to go to the moon. And then he spent the next two years denying the laws of gravity. The rocket would never take off. Yeah. A lot of people would get hurt and eventually mm -hmm. people would understand that there are laws of gravity. You can't, you can deny the laws of economics, right. but eventually they catch up to you. And that's the way we think about it, that people have to, if you're going to have the leader of the country declaring something that's totally inaccurate about how tariffs work, yeah. one, we have to educate people by mm -hmm. talking about it. But the reality is it, it will hit people. And we try to point people to the history of our industry right? because we pay such heavy tariffs already. And I never have to predict the future. I can just look to the past great and, those, and those, those tariffs. The highest for us uh, with waterproof breathable shoes, certain of them, 37.5% tariff, which will now be 47.5%. Because right. yes. um, we make a lot of those in China. So it's really pointing to that mm -hmm. and trying to educate people. But... Um, what we say is essentially if, if people in Washington would pay as much attention to consumers as we and others in the industry do, mm -hmm. they wouldn't be doing what they're doing. They would not. That's a great point. You know, we take the data and we lay on top. We, we take the price of an import, footwear, chapter 64. We track that for, for decades and decades and we lay that on top of the consumer price index for footwear. And as prices, and this is all U.S. government data, as prices rise and fall, those, those savings and or those price increases are, are passed on to the American consumer. It's an inevitable fact. And so we have the, their own data to kind of prove this point to them. But let's play devil's advocate, because I don't want to be totally clubbing the idea that there isn't some pain on the Chinese, right? Because yeah, yeah. demand is down. Uh, you hear about great pricing opportunities for folks sourcing in China or staying put. There's obviously migration. We hear about it anecdotally. We'll start to see it in the data, I think, very, very soon. Uh, a migration that's been in hyperdrive. It's been we've been migrating for some time now. But is there something to be said? Maybe they're not explaining it right. Is there something to be said about the pain that the Chinese do take on because of the taxes that we put on American consumers as a government? Well, I mean, it's clearly from what I read and hear. I mean, it's causing some pain there. But mm -hmm. you know, there's the main point is that these are economic sanctions put on American employers and American consumers. Right. There are economic sanctions They're to block people from, uh, you know, getting something, and, and you know, we may all be barefoot by the time people realize how expensive <laughs> footwear is going to get. Right. right. Well, is that a policy? I mean, if they came to us and said, "Hey, we're we need to decouple as a as the United States, we need to decouple from 
from China. We are funding their rise because we're buying the stuff they're making and we need to separate ourselves. And so there's going to be pain. We're going to add duties. It's going to be American consumer sin tax. If you buy stuff from China, you can pay, pay more. If they said all those things and were honest with us, are those pills that we can swallow as an industry? Because we are deep cut. And I'm, again, this is devil's advocate. If you're just tuning in now, don't, I'm having <laughs> drank, I haven't drank any Kool-Aid, um, but are we, is there something to be said about decoupling from China as an industry or as a broader society? Well, I, I, I mean, I'm going to, again, point to the past. Mm -hmm. I would say in the last administration, and it wasn't just the Democratic administration, it was also Republicans working on this. There was some effort to incentivize that, just that kind of change with the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Yeah. In other words, we're going to give you an incentive to not rely on China, and we're going to have, you know, different trading rules that later they can be incentivized to join. Mm -hmm. And I try to, again, as we try to deal with the press and, and the public to, to explain how that could work in a thoughtful way right. and an honest way. Right. It's a tale of two countries. Look at Canada, which stayed in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, where they've encouraged us and others to be sourcing mm -hmm. in, in a place like Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And you get an incentive for it, being a lower tariff. And then you have, and you have time to plan for it. There's debate and discussion, involvement of stakeholders and allies, right. all things that are predictable so you can understand the consequences, maximize the benefits for society, all of those things. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have sort of wildly swinging in a pinata. And, and it's, <laughs> so that's- Imported in from China. Not to pass judgment on right, how it's sure. being done. So right. I mean, it, it, there, there's a reason that trade policy in the world, and certainly for this country, has taken place over the course of years and decades. Mm -hmm. And it's just for those kind of reasons to be able to involve people. So there, it is fair, and I think it's been an ongoing conversation in Washington about right. nobody uses, I've not heard de decoupling before sort of this year and the things that you right. read. Right. It's a more, you know, push to diversify and create a, a U.S.-based uh, sort of set of standards, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And this, this is actually doing the opposite. One of the things we're finding in our company is we're spending more time well, obviously, we have to deal with the changes in, D in uh, policy in D.C. Right. In terms of trade agreements, we're focusing on regional agreements mm -hmm. because Vietnam is striking arrangements with whether it's Russia or the EU, EU yeah. et cetera. So there are all kinds of opportunities there. And we're still in the Trans-Pacific Partnership as a company working in our Canadian business, right. which is why we think about it. Right. So we're turning our attention there where the U.S., frankly, isn't at the table and is being left behind. Yeah. And it's sad to see. It is very sad to see. And, and even the the remaining 11, basically, they didn't touch the agreement. When we pulled out, they left every T crossed the same way, every I was dotted the same way in the hopes that when we get our act together and kind of come out of the stupor, that we would rejoin and be the leader. And it was really interesting as they were making their way, because as, as an organization, as a company, in my prior political life, we worked on TVP for a decade. Right. And when we left, there was this vacuum where the, the 11 countries were trying to figure out who's gonna be, who's gonna leave this, who's even gonna schedule the next negotiating round because right. we were driving everything. We are, it should not be lost to people how much of a force, how much of a leadership position we took in the world of trade. And we just kind of gave that up. And looking right. back, I don't wanna be, I told you so, but this is the, per, to your point, perfect policy option to do exactly what the administration claims it wants to do as it relates to combating China. And they just don't, is it their pride? Is it something else? They just don't want to agree to the fact that that might have been a rash mistake to pull out on day one. Yeah, I mean, I've, I have talked to at least one person in the administration. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not going to give, give a name. Sure. Um, it's not a relative of, of the president, who, who, <laughs> but basically <laughs> said that, uh, you know, that was a good deal. Yeah. That was a good deal. Uh, so hopefully that's still available, but certainly as a model, mm -hmm. and it's something that can, you, one can hold up right now and say, this is one way to do it, here's another way to do it. Right. And it involves working with allies and not, not going it alone. Now, talk to me about what does your presence look like now in China? A lot of our brands have said, look, we're not pulling out all together. We want China for China. We want to serve other markets with China, product made in China. Uh, we're we're bringing it down significantly, but we, we can't cut and run entirely. So what's the current profile of Columbia within China? I know you have some JVs as well in China that are important yeah. to you. And then what's the future look like in the next five years? Well, so we, uh, our, the value of our production coming into the U.S. as a percentage of our business, about 15, less than 15% comes from China mm -hmm. in terms of dollar value, not number of units, but dollar value. Uh, and it's probably lower than that. So it's between 10 and 15%. 
that was already underway. Right. For a variety of different reasons, we're selling in more than more than ninety countries. As I said, we're very diversified. And then we do have a uh, we had a JV, which we now uh, own that business okay, entirely to sell it. there. So it's a big market for selling. So we make things there to sell. And we also make things there for the rest of the world. Right. And it's one of the you know one of the challenges when people will say, well, why not just make it in this place? Why not just make it in this place? There's a complicated web of trade arrangements around the globe. Yeah. And it's and it's it's both for trade agreements, but also the logistics of, of uh, delivering. So if you said, well, just make all of those jackets in, in Portland, there, there's lots of reasons why that might not happen because people haven't invested in factories here right. and that's the rest of the supply chain. But it also, that doesn't get me to the other 90, you know, 89 countries. Right. So this is obviously an important market, uh, but our model is to be able to serve all, all of those countries. Yeah. Maybe one factory that's making a lot of those jackets and they're going, everywhere and frankly when the u.s goes it alone the way it is mm -hmm. making it here ask the farmers whether they want to be sourcing totally here i mean right. that's 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 you you'd be targeted for we've had issues you know uh components from the u.s mm -hmm. that have been subject to retaliation yeah in other places yeah. and i know we're talking china here but this i mean we got the whole uh all kinds of you the know, environment is fights. toxic right, right. now it yeah. is but that's Let's pivot to your fearless leader, Tim Boyle, who um, yeah. is doing a great job because I think there's a number of executives, and rightfully so. These are, you know, you have publicly traded companies, you have, you know, you have shareholders. You need to make sure are copacetic. You you have quarterly earnings. Clearly, today was a terrible day for the stock market. Yeah. Um, but uh, Tim has been vocal. He's been unafraid. He's been honest and frank and upfront. Um, and it's been refreshing for us. We, we gave you all the advocate of the year this year because of that. Um, and I just, I want to kind of walk through the dynamic that the leadership that Tim has set forth for the rest of the industry to follow suit. Um, talk to me about how he thinks about these things and why he's been so adamant about being upfront and honest with, with your, the employees, with the American people, with your customers about why this is such a bad idea. Yeah, and I would say there's a couple of issues that he's been very outspoken on, and uh, I don't know if he's watching. I mean, he, <laughs> these, these could be my last comments if I'm uh, trying to try to uh, you know speak speak for him in terms of what's on his mind. But sure. in, our, in our conversations, I mean, it's really been around the immigration, it started with the, the travel ban, and then um, about trade. And we've spoken out on trade before, yeah. but in more trying to get people's attention for the good things like TPP and. What he said, and I, I think it's the case, if, there, if you're in a position where you can speak out when mm -hmm. there's something you know this serious going on, you should. Yeah. And, and it's not about, and particularly he was questioned on, on uh, immigration questions uh, last week on uh, Morning Joe on MSNBC. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and, uh, and there's people who are upset when you, when you make a comment about telling, telling somebody to go home. Right. When they're actually from here. Right. Um, go home. Right. I mean, right. It just, right. It's not the, uh, I live in the swamp, and, D.C. So yeah. But it is what he's said is, that, look, this is not about uh, money. This mm -hmm. is about who we are as human beings Values, and how, right. how yeah. we treat people as human beings and having your integrity. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're, you know, as a company and he uh, in a position to be able to do that and take the risk. And uh, it, with respect to trade uh, we, and any of these, frankly, partly when we speak when we speak, and he gives me freedom to, to speak on them as well, is, is uh, it helps other people to speak out. Mm -hmm. And that's, we need, we need more of that, to, yeah. to, you know, partly to educate people who may not be paying attention. And it's not about partisan, I've got friends in all, you know, different, right. different parties, but it's about yeah. uh, making it easier for people collectively to, to speak up. And then, you know, Speaking on trade, what are they going to do? Put a twenty-five percent tax on me? <laughs> they did it. I mean, I, yeah, yeah. What else can they do? How how much worse can it get? Right, right. Yeah. Right. So the movement of, of goods and people and engagement with the world is fundamental to who our business is. It's what mm -hmm. makes us strong. We think it's what makes the country strong. Yeah. I think that you need to address the disruption that goes with trade. Sure, and help people. Whose, whose industries may be disrupted, but you know we've we've been a job creator in the U.S. for a long period of time, mm -hmm. uh, not shipping any jobs elsewhere. Right. Yeah. I mean, so, is there a concern that it'll be a drag on the brand in the sense that anytime I go on TV and do an interview, the moment I walk off set, we get email and hate mail about yeah. I'm a communist. I should move to. If I love China so much, I should move there. I'm not a patriot. My father was a Marine Corps for 30 years, Vietnam vet. I've worked in the U.S. government. I, I love my country. 
But at the same time, it does get on you because you're you just sort of feel like you're arguing against a brick wall, and right. and there's almost a cult out there that kind of drives. So, have you been concerned about as a brand alienating customers, people who you know? I don't want to stereotype you know outdoor people or. Yeah. Yeah, have you thought about what the impact on the brand would be if you take these stances? I'm not saying don't do it, but there's got to be some kind of calculation about what blowback there will be, if any. You know, we, we took out a uh, page ad in the print edition of the uh, Washington Post last year during the government shutdown. Mm-hmm. And basically, it was just about keep the parks open. And we had to plan words, you know, make, make America's parks open again. Right. And, uh, you know, we got probably more hits on that than anything, and that came from a conversation with the two of us. It wasn't a marketing thing. It, was, it came together in just a few hours. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we should do that, mm-hmm. that, that kind of thing. And I remember just thinking about it myself. Not, there was, I mean, the risk assessment was about 10 seconds, right? So there was just this, <laughs> this would be a good thing to do. And that's, that's and, we, and frankly, we got calls. And Tim said as much to the Wall Street Journal when they mm-hmm. asked him about it. But in my own thinking about it, it's like, well, who can be really upset about keeping the parks open? Right. I mean, that's where our consumers go. Right. And yet, once that happens, it was just like piranhas, mm-hmm. you know, going after each other mm-hmm. on Twitter. So, in part, I don't read all those. Yeah. Just things don't even look at it. Uh, but then there were some that were great. It would attack us and say, "We're not buying any more of your stuff." I, I was gonna, I was gonna buy this. I'm not gonna buy this. I'm not gonna buy the North Face, a competitor of ours. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna buy Sorel. Right. We own Sorel. They just don't know it. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, you know, if I can have somebody not buy a competitive product and, and buy one of our other brands, that works. So it's just kind of crazy. I'm just kind of assuming they're all bots. You know? Let's hope, because if you, if you want to think, you know, if you want to be depressed about the human condition, just go on Twitter after you say something against the president's policy. Not even a personal shot of the president himself, but against policy. And it's, you might as well, might as well have said, you know, something terrible against your own country and it's yeah it's disconcerting to say the least yeah no it is but it, it it's interesting because we, we've got such a broad base of yeah. consumers and you know we're very big in in rural areas we sell hunting and fishing mm-hmm. stuff that you know be more popular in some of those mm-hmm. places and you know we're grounded in, in in trying to we're trying to meet those consumers needs yeah i mean before this, they would never contact us and say, would you please put a 10% tax on my product? <laughs> right. So we're, we are trying to help. <laughs> um, but it's it's basically people not wanting to have a conversation. People are angry and, right. and focused on, on things. But frankly, we've been in a good growth period. I, I don't think anybody believes we've lost any meaningful sale right. as a result of any of it. Right. And I think because and of who Tim is. Yeah. yeah, that's what I was going to say. Because of who Tim is and his background, the Holocaust and his family survived yeah. the Holocaust that as he spoke on our executive summit earlier this year, like he wouldn't care, right? It's the right thing to do, no matter what the outcome is. And so we appreciate that. Let's dig into your background a little bit, because as you're talking about these these things, I just think you're kind of so well positioned and you're you know, where you are at Columbia Sports where, for this time because of your background. So why don't, you haven't been in, in outdoor, you had an outdoor company forever. You have a lot of other interesting past. Tell us kind of where you've been and some of the things you've done in your career that have primed you for the intersection of politics, fashion, you know, products, et cetera, et cetera. The only consistent thing in my career is I've dressed poorly throughout. <laughs> uh, like I, uh, uh, but I was a journalist, I started out as a journalist in Washington, D.C., uh, not to date myself, 84 to 90. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was uh, back then. Before there was fake news. Right? Yeah, yeah, back oh, really? then, but so that was in the middle, well, I left in the middle of George uh, Bush 41. senior mm-hmm. yeah, term. And, you know, the prevailing thought among journalists was, well, this is, you know, the partisanship is horrible. Congress will never get anything done. Now those are the good old days. Um, and I ended up on a fellowship in law school and took a took a path to come out here. And I've been basically in and out of media, politics, and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the private sector. So yeah. my job before this, I, I, I'd been at Columbia. I took a leave of absence to go be chief of staff for Oregon's governor, uh, Ted Kulingoski, for about a year, year and a half. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, and came back to this. And trade is, frankly, I, uh, so trade is an issue for me that brings together, you know, media, mm-hmm. politics, and public policy, yep. law, and you know, just a passion we have for within the business for getting those products to consumers and and around the globe. Right? Yeah, we, we we feel like we're selling Oregon and and the United States when we're elsewhere. The pictures of these mountains. Yeah, Mount you know, Hood, freaking stamped. Columbia, I mean, yeah, Columbia yeah. River. It's... Yeah, around the globe. Then, mm-hmm. then we have these things that are stamped and say about 
Portland, Oregon. Yeah. And it means something. Uh, it, you know, much more than it ever did because Portland's kind of thing, and, and people, people, and you know, care about what the United States produces. They so do. it kind of undermines it when we other otherwise attacking all those people. Yeah. No, that, that that's that's an understatement. I mean. Let's talk about a few more things, and I do want to open it up for those who have questions in the audience. We'd be happy to answer them. But you know, one of the things I had the opportunity to come um, in the spring of 2015. President Obama was here um, in Beaverton, gave a speech at Nike, and I, just as background, I, I worked on trade policy in the Bush administration. So, um, um, so I, I'm kind of Republican classic or a recovering Republican, if you will, um, and. And I just remember being at the speech, the weather was beautiful, um, everyone was feeling good. It was right at the kind of the peak of pushing TPP, trying to get it done for President Obama left office. And we had a great relationship with his office. Um, but to your point, trade has always been like this bipartisan thing. But what I think President Obama did differently that other presidents haven't done, both Republican and Democrat, is be honest about where our economy is in the 21st century. Right going to Nike, an importing company, and saying, you know what, the jobs of the 21st century in this industry are, are represented in this in this courtyard, if you will. Uh, as much as we love to manufacture, manufacturing jobs are great, but they shouldn't be the tail that wags the dog. Our policy should be set on a 21st century framework. And he was on it, he talked about automation, the impact that has on, on the, the, the decline of jobs. Um, if you talk to the National Association of Manufacturers, um, uh, they will tell you, their chief economists will tell you, we make more now here in the U.S. than we've ever made in our history. You just don't hear those things. So are we are, we, are there just not enough bold politicians to be honest with us about this isn't 1945. We're not going to be making shoes domestically. We're not going to make a billion pairs of shoes domestically. It's time to move on and figure out how we support more of the jobs that are here in this room. Yeah, I think the, uh, I mean, a shortage of honest politicians is probably not a, not a new thing. <laughs> but, yeah. I do think that uh, on, and I'll just pick trade because that mm -hmm. to me is the one that really we've had decades of one sort of sided argument against trade mm -hmm. in the political arena, meaning in campaigns. Right. So the governor that I worked for during the campaign, I was in one of the strategy sessions, and uh, this was you know, 20 years after, you know, some long period of time after NAFTA, right. and everybody was pounding the table saying, you've got to go into that speech and just attack NAFTA. Mm -hmm. and, I remember saying, "Well, that's this is probably my last meeting," um, <laughs> and he didn't do it in that thing. But it, but uh, it, I think there's a, you know, it, it works to divide people mm -hmm. and to upset people and motivate people, and that's that's what happens in the political arena. And uh, frankly, in, in talking to the press when we were doing some of the TPP work, you know, several years ago, yeah, some of the main publications, and I have a, a good friend at the New York Times who was thinking about doing a trade story and said, "Because there's nobody." Doing trade full time at the New York Times now. All these places, everyone's doing full time. Mm -hmm. So um, I think there's a, a shortage of, of real understanding about it. But mm -hmm. I, that, to me, is the opportunity. One for all these different outlets that are really focused on it. And part of my test is that I'm now hearing from some Democratic politicians things that I used to try to convince them of. Mm -hmm. So it's hey, this tariff is a tax on the consumer. I said, yeah, that's what we were telling you. Right, right. But now, on the flip side, there are people in you know, the Republican Party who used who, to say those things. Who like, used to say those oh, things. Nothing to see and now they're, now, they're, now they're more quiet about yeah, it. Be patient with the strategy, you know? Yeah. yeah. No, that's true. I mean, to that point, are you, you know, one of the concerns, Smoot Hawley is 90 years old next next year. Yeah, happy anniversary. Happy anniversary, anniversary. yeah, exactly. Um, when you start adding tariffs and start driving revenue to the U.S. government, it's so hard to call that back. Yeah. You're not, I'm not really hearing anything on the Democratic side of the candidates saying, yeah. hey, as soon as you, if you like me, I will eliminate tariffs on China, because that's just not going to be politically popular in the Democratic Party. Right. Um, is, is there any hope? For those of us on a bipartisan in a bipartisan space that want trade liberalization, are we just kind of a dying breed? Um, we may be slumbering. Slumbering. The, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I mean, we're but we're you know we're a strong business. We've got a strong balance sheet. No doubt that kind of you know long term yeah. view. Mm -hmm. And you know we're preparing for the fact that this could go on for a long time, including new people coming in who are going to embrace it or feel the need to keep the revenues. Mm -hmm. And we think that's bad. So we want to, you know, spend the time doing that. I mean, unfortunately, and I do think this is the case, it's that people have to feel the pain from what's being done. Yeah. And I think some of the chickens are coming home to roost already. Yeah. 
we feel it already in a different way within our business, just the aluminum and steel. Are you telling me that? Yeah, talk so, about that. It's well, we, you know, within days of, of that, we got notices that our cost of mannequins was going up. I mean, so it lands on my desk. It was just like, <laughs> how did I get? How did I get that job? Um, and so, mannequin cost review. Yeah, and I, I started coming up with plans to you know send four hundred. 35 mannequins to Washington, the million mannequin march, um, you know, anything I could. You know, Which would take any, a million humans to have, have make happen. So. Yeah, and then I was just going to use Photoshop to do it, but I didn't get around to it. But it was, you know, it's that, it's light fixtures, it's, it's uh, things like that. So if you're in the, you know, if you're in expansion mode, which we are, mm -hmm. both from building uh, things out of our headquarters or store build outs. These things add up. Oh yeah, and we can absorb them, and they're not gigantic. I mean, the, the mannequin thing cost me an extra sixteen thousand dollars, I think. Mm -hmm. Right, but that's real money. Yeah, that's real money, and that's maybe that's a summer intern we didn't hire. Mm -hmm. But all of these things are things that uh, you know divert. You know, the time we spend and the money we spend gets diverted away from other things that would be investing in consumers or you know our employees in yeah. ways that, uh, and that money's being you know, taken by the government. And yeah. it, 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 so. I mean, the, you walk the floor here at the Northwest Materials Show and I see all these amazing innovations and you yeah. think, let's see, let's let's take $3 billion away from the industry by adding this 10% tariff on imports between now and December 15th. And that's money that doesn't get invested in these kind of innovations that are happening out here. And that's right. the thing about tariffs. They're just so, not only are they, they impact the economy as a whole, they're just a, not a growth they just don't drive growth in any aspect of our companies, our economy, our society. And so that's just been the big frustration for us is that somehow one economist on the planet was hired by a president who loves tariffs. And we're kind of stuck with that all those policy ramifications for, for could be years. And well, it's it. And I think the tweet, and I, I may have this wrong, but yeah. I think it said a small 10 percent. Right. And that's some of, uh, you know, uh, one of the networks which shall remain nameless was question, questioning us about, well, it's only 10%. Right. But for people who are paycheck to paycheck in a country where wages are barely growing, I don't know what the average increase would be for people, but it's got to be under 3%. Yeah, it's not 10%. You don't put a 10% on tax all on. goods. Not and that's just on the new stuff. Right. You had the, you had the 25 and then yeah. there's all the hidden, hidden ones. And that's... That's really meaningful, and it will, you know, it, it uh, you know, what I said to a reporter this morning, where, you know, one favor, go call every member of Congress and ask them, where's the bailout for consumers? Because they're going to need it. That's right. And uh, they're going to be surprised by what's going to hit them, and what will, the next people to be surprised will be the politicians, because once the consumers get it, and, and I'm, 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 you know, I'm afraid that's what's going to have to happen. Yeah, no, you're right, you're right. Well, those are all the questions that I could think of off the top of my head for Peter. Um, what questions do you all have for him or other updates you might need on the tariff front as it relates to these these new lists? Any questions you have for us? Do not be shy. Yes, sir. We'll never know what would have been if the other major party had won the last election. Right. But at the time the election was happening, there wasn't an appetite for TPP in either party. Right. And that seems to be a re response to polling, right? So there was little public support for TPP. What, how, I mean, how do you, how do you anticipate when you say that the, maybe the door is open um, down the road for a future administration, maybe or a change of partners administration, but how do you overcome something like that? Just speculate. Well, how do you get past the, what is probably still a negative perception publicly yeah. of GDP, regardless of what might happen with the current tariffs, I don't think they're going to be associated. Right. Yeah, let me kind of repeat this for those are folks are online. The question is essentially, um, both parties were, you know, when it comes to trade, were not in favor of TPP in the 2016 election. There was polling that showed of the agreement. And so how do we, for those of us who want to re-engage TPP or want a candidate who will, how do you overcome the public perception that is negative against the agreement? Yeah, I'll just say a couple of things, and you probably have sure. a, a better sense. But I, I think that's, I mean, you could sense even some of the things that are happening now could happen, just given the hostility to that agreement, which had so many good things to it. I'm related to people who hated it. I mean, I'm there, I just know a lot of people. Right. It doesn't matter uh, what I said. And I think, you know, I'm not sure how many people are here are actually from Portland, but, you know, I think there's a lot of people 
in this town that think the port is for an after dinner drink, you know, instead of <laughs> instead of for engagement in the world and, and shipping and, and that kind of thing. So this uh, this state, which has been frankly, uh, people were dreaming about trade with China when Jefferson and Astor talked about setting up what became Astoria. Yeah, right. So that's that's got deep roots here, and for 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 there to be some host- so much hostility to TPP and some of the trade things, you could feel that shifting. Uh, and I, frankly, I, I take it on ourselves that there, there needed to be and has needed to be more education about the benefits, probably more sharing of the benefits and less or, or more uh, helping to address through the safety nets things for, for people who are disrupted. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a fair point. I think there, there is a nationalism that's kind of running through a lot of different societies, not just the U.S., not just American society, where trade, international trade, the removal of borders, the removal of the national identity gets people very concerned. And so when you think about a multilateral agreement with 12 nations, people get really nervous about, I think, that kind of setup. I think that's why the president has been so adamant. We do bilaterals. We do bilaterals. And today he's notified Congress of the intent to negotiate with Japan. The UK, once it leaves the European Union and then in the European Union, Union as well. Um, I will say this, though, it takes leadership to, in the face of public opinion to chart trade paths. Um, and I can remember at the time when I worked in the Bush administration, there was a debate, a Democratic debate. Tim Russert was the moderators in Ohio. And all that was left was Senator Clinton and Senator Obama in the race on the Democratic side. And they were debating with each other about who will, will you leave NAFTA? Will you get out of NAFTA? And they were both open to the fact that we would leave NAFTA. And so we had to start talking as an administration about the benefits of NAFTA and the agreement was 20 years old. And I remember going back and look at the data because all I've been told is that the Clinton administration era, I was in, I was in high school and college for it, but the Clinton administration era was the boom of job creation and how amazing the 90s were for economic growth. And I thought to myself, how can we have the worst agreement ever negotiated on the planet, as President Trump calls it, and have one of the greatest decades of growth? And so I went and looked at the date that NAFTA went into effect in 1994 to the end, to the January 20th, 2001, when President Clinton left office. 28 million new jobs were created. And you just that's where the, the hyperbole gets out of hand. That's where the anecdotal stories of automation and the movement of some production out of key Midwestern uh, cities takes hold of, to become a national narrative. And I just said, you can't, you got to look at the data. And so it's, it goes back to your point. You have to educate people. And sometimes you have to lead against headwinds and knowing that on a whole, economically, it's better for our country. And I think we don't have that leadership right now. I do I mean, just one other. I, mean, I do see opportunity in some of this. I'm not talking about for our company, just generally as a society, because this is one of these things where you know we need rural communities to do well. Yeah. Trade to me is a you know you got basically you can have a conservative wheat farmer in eastern Oregon or Washington state that's going to have something very much in common with a liberal footwear designer in Portland on, on this issue. And I've been on mm-hmm. panels with potato growers mm-hmm. and rail car makers, and there's a chance to have a different dialogue. And you really. Most of your, I don't know about other people, you know, if you're hiking on a trail, you don't think about the party that a person was in when they walked past. You're thinking about, so there's, you know, some of the industry that we're in, I think, gives a chance to have some outreach mm-hmm. and find some common ground on things. And doesn't mean everybody gets what they want. But, yeah, but, that's uh, a great point. Yeah, if there was a Venn diagram of different type of people, we all intersect and have this commonality, whether we love the outdoors, we love great product or whatever the case may be. So what other questions do folks have? Yes, ma'am. I have one. Um, so I work primarily in the footwear industry, and with the projected small 10 to 10, there's this conversation that we might have to block you on more of our footwear to be the duty change. So is there any sort of public domain or discussion where we revisit these duty protocols to lessen the quality of yeah, so for folks online, the question is, because of this added duty, um, what kind of, the, you may use flocking to kind of lower your duty rate, um, and, you know, what other kind of forums are available for the discussion of tariff engineering. This is something we do every single day. We advise our members on tweaks they can make to product to help legally engineer away from certain duty codes. And Peter talked about the, the pocket example. That's what we get where our companies are pros at figuring out how not to be 37.5% if you can avoid it. 
Um, we have an event in October in Long Beach where we do it in person. People bring samples in and we, we advise them on how those samples should be constructed in order to avoid certain duty rates. But it's a, it's to your question, the more you add on the duty rates, the more our, our industry is innovative. I mean, again, walk that floor out there. We are an innovative industry, and that means we're going to look to avoid certain duty constructs if we can, even if it ultimately means we're taking away features. And that's what we've all we've argued to the American government and said, you're going to add these duty rates. And so people are going to pay the same price or something or, or a little bit more. Um, and then it's going to have less features because we're going to have to engineer away from that. I, that's a, a huge frustration, but that's something we do all the time, every single day. I mean, it kind of highlights one thing that I think gets lost in the debate is that, that, that all of this tariff is a massive expansion of government regulation, basically of what's in your closet yeah. in the case of our industry, you know, what materials it's made of, how much of those materials in there, what the features are, where it's from. I mean, it's all of those things, which is one of the most intrusive things and it's distorting mm -hmm. in the marketplace. And we get asked more questions about it. There was a piece in the New York Times back in November where they came in and basically walked through all that. Yeah, great piece, with us. Great. Um, great spread. Great picture uh, in the New York Times. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, the, uh, I think I was probably wearing the same shirt. You probably were. <laughs> yeah, it's fishing, always a fishing shirt. Um, but you can't engineer your way around chaos. And and mm -hmm. that is you know, part of our message that, yes, once, you, once we know what the rules are, we can be, behave. But the, the, the moves that you're talking about or that you're talking about, none of it really matters if policy changes on a, on a really a weekly day-to-day -day That's true. That's true. And I, I, something I failed to mention in, in our talk is that it's 10% at the border, but the end consumer, it could be more than 10% yeah. because you exchange it amongst a variety of hands in the supply chain. And so I remember we put out, so we put out some numbers of estimates. We've taken product off of e-commerce sites and said, okay, it's currently this price. We back it down, knowing what the, the duty classification is at this point, and then we we add. I mean, we know it's thirty-seven and a half percent or twenty percent for running. We throw the ten percent on, and then we crank it back up in the normal kind of retail math, and we put it out there. And I got people on Twitter to talk, talk, talking about how idiotic we are. That how could you have a ten percent tax at the border and not have a ten, and have more than a ten percent increase at retail? And so that's another challenge: is okay. the math doesn't line up to people think it's simple. It's not that simple. Um, and so we, we've struggled to make that connection to people like, you know, you have a canvas sneaker, it's 50 bucks. It's going to be $60 with a 10% hike. And people are like, that's, that math is fuzzy. So, um, it's not always easy to explain complex retail math yeah. to, to the layman. Oh yeah. I mean, and, and, uh, and frankly, some companies with these immediate things, mm -hmm. uh, may spread it over other products, you know, just to, to capture it because they can't do it all in one. That's right. Product. That's a great so, point. So. Any other questions? In time for one or two more. Where, where can you get information? For instance, like what you just brought up about Part Four A and Four B on the ten percent. You know, being in the industry and is affected by the thirty-seven and a half percent duty rate. Where, where can you get that information? Like, what exactly was it? Were they referring to? So that's a great question. So. From a process perspective, the United States Trade Representative's Office published the list yesterday on their website, USTR.gov, and it listed the products on list 4A and 4B at, a, at an HTS classification level at the eight digit level. And then now we are awaiting what's called a Federal Register Notice, an FR Notice for uh, to be published this week that directs customs on how to treat these imports when the actual in, the date starts, because I think the first is on a weekend. And whether or not it's product as entered by September 1st or exported by September 1st, our assumption is that it has to be imported by September 1st. I think we've done once in our history where we've allowed export date and now it's list three going from 10 to 25%. So anytime we, as an organization, we have a, we have a weekly call at one o'clock Eastern on Fridays where we walk through and answer questions for our members. We did one yesterday, an emergency call when this list came out, but it's most, as soon as st stuff's out there, it's usually usgr.gov where people are going to get it. Yeah. But I, mean, I would say just from our, I mean, we rely heavily on, on trade associations like FDR right, to have it synthesized quickly. Not, I mean, because you can go to those sites and like trying to sort through that. I mean, we've got teams of experts, but, you know, people were really scrambling yesterday, for exactly. example. And that's part of the, again, part of the problem with the way things are, are uh, unfolding. That's right. One more question. Who's got it? Got to be one. What's the question? 
how would you expect or advise or recommend buyers to respond to tariff increases? Hmm. I think um, I think having a collab. I think the any time from a broader sense you see a successful partnership between a comp a brand and its suppliers, it's a collaborative process. Whether it's on uh, sourcing shifts, or where we shift as an industry successfully, it's usually with a current partner, a Taiwanese partner, or a Chinese partner, whomever working with us to move to the new market. When we collaborate on compliance issues, on auditing, on social compliance, it is it's it's this partnership. And I think we all know what's happening. You can't hide from it. We know that ten percent is being is a part of the equation coming up September first. So being collaborative and being constructive and figuring out how to, how do you take on a share? How maybe the brand takes on some, the consumer takes on some. When we get to twenty five percent, all bets are off. But in the meantime, I think you know this. Now's the time to show your worth in the sense that things are hitting the fan. And if you're collaborative and thoughtful and constructive, I think those you'll once we get through this, your customer will look on the back and say, you know what, I'm glad I stuck with these guys because they were they were very helpful navigating this and during a difficult time. And I would just add a couple of things. I, you know, a lot of factory groups obviously have factories in multiple yeah. countries, and we, you know, we pride ourselves on having good long-term relationships. Mm -hmm. So I would agree with everything you said. The only other comment I would add is that um, this trade policy, in a lot of ways, does undermine other policies of the U.S. Uh, projected internationally or consumer expectations. So the notion that we would just cut and run and leave a factory with a bunch of workers there right. when they had planned to be working. I mean, obviously we have to adjust our, our business, but we also have a way that we exit factories that is meant to be, you know, make sure that people are paid in compliance and mm -hmm. not overly mm -hmm. disruptive. And when we go into a new place, there are steps we go through. Right. And so there's some of the things we're not moving is because we know we can't move them in a way that would fit with our own views of, of uh, how people are treated and compliance and quality and all of those things. Yeah. And so, you know, it's more complicated than, and it's easier for people who are politicians in Washington to, to think, oh, just move it from that place to that place. It's physically sometimes not possible, but it's also something that, you know, we're not willing to do for all the right reasons. Right. All right. So I saw your hand one more time. I saw your hand. Do you want to ask your last question or? Uh, sure. Uh are there any thoughts of revisiting all of the tariff engineering so that it would put more power to designers and developers at NFC? So the chapter 64 in the harmonized tariff schedule in the United States has 436 classifications at the 10 digit level. It is a product of a variety of different things. Think of a chapter 64 as like an old Cape Cod house that you've put on all these weird additions to, and there's a deck off the side that leads to nowhere. And, there's, and it's just this massive thing that as an industry, we're, we're culpable, but and in collaboration with the US government, where we built out all these exceptions and all these ways to define what product is. And, and we ventured as an organization to try to simplify the tariff code and boil it down to a handful of lines. And it is so difficult to unwind that right now because people are utilizing all the different tricks of the trade. I told Customs and Border Protection at a Customs Forum earlier this year, they asked me the same question, how do we simplify this? I said, take all tariffs to zero and it'll all go away like that. So and other than that, I don't think, I think we're going to be in an environment where you have to be really creative and thoughtful and, and be frustrated along the way. And we will share that. We will share all those emotions with you along the way. Um, but that's kind of the environment we're in right now. Okay. And I would, I would just say, what we say is essentially the largest footwear and apparel design center on the planet is on Capitol Hill, and it's the 535 members of you know, the House and the Senate. So you could run for that, and uh, <laughs> that would help. Peter, I can't thank you enough. This has been a lot of fun. I really appreciate your honesty, your frankness. I appreciate the audience. Please help me in thanking Peter for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Peter.